Hello folks and welcome back to the Gallant View Rangers podcast. Colin here and I'm delighted to have another very special guest on. This time is Alfredo from the Benfica podcast. Alfredo, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you, Colin? I'm good. I'm good. Um, Thanks for having me. Oh no, no, always a always a pleasure. Um it's so to give you a bit of context, Alfredo, um we've started a new series of of shows where we bring on uh, a guest from another from the opposition's podcast because I think we've been getting a bit too Rangers biased on the Gallon Few, so it's been good to <laughs> to have a, a bit of back sure. and forth. So obviously um we were recording Thursday the twenty ninth, a week before Rangers play at Benfica in the first uh, leg of the the last sixteen. So, honest opinion, how are you feeling about the the draw? Well, we as as a Benficaista, I thought that the draw was pretty favorable, and obviously, no disrespect to to Rangers, right? Because uh, Rangers do have their pedigree in in Europe and in Scotland and European football. Uh, but I, I felt that there were worse teams that we could have gotten uh, in a draw. So we were we were fortunate uh, to be able to draw Rangers. And like I said, no disrespect, of course, but it, we felt that it, it's Rangers are are a team that are accessible to Benfica, at least on paper. Right. Uh, you still have to play on on the pitch. And that's a complete different story. Yeah, that, I think it's. I think it's a fair assessment. Um, as much as I would love to come out and say, you know, Rangers are going to win 6 0, uh, both guys. I think, um, I think from a Rangers point of view, we're very aware Benfica, oh, Benfica are a good, good side, um, good pedigree, been playing Champions League football regularly. Yeah. Um, and Rangers, while, we're, while we are, in a good bit of form just now domestically. Six months ago, we were in a rut. So this is very much, um, you know, new territory for, for Rangers yep. this season. We're just really starting to find our feet. I don't know if um, if these two games against Benfica come just at the wrong time for Rangers. Um, I think there's a few injuries. There's a, there's a lot of league games. We're now in a title race with... Um, with Celtic, we've got the cup game coming up. I don't know if Rangers have a squad to to manage both games, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, but the, the other thing that we also have to realise that there's a lot of times that even though a team might not be doing well domestically, uh, the team is very motivated to play in Europe because they're playing in, in a big stage with a lot of eyes. There's a lot of media coverage. So I think that oftentimes uh, team, not that teams hold on to it, saying this is our season here and we should focus on European competition, but certainly it's 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 a, a bit of a change of of pace in terms of yep. the the international shop and and window and whatnot. But I I think that when you get to this level where we're playing against some of the better teams in Europe. Uh, rather than you know the the opposition and domestically, I think that there it's a different thing and it's a different approach by the team and the technical staff. Yeah, I, I think that's a fair point, and you know I, I think when we when we made it, all, I made the point that you know it, it's going to be a very hard game, but it's not not no, no ties impossible. But I think um, f- from a Rangers point of view. The, the first tie is going to be massive. So, obviously, the first game is in uh, in Portugal. I think Rangers need to come away with a draw or still in the tie to take it back to Ibrox because like, you, uh, you would have seen firsthand um, that uh, Ibrox can be a special place in, in Europe. Yeah. And it's, um, so, I, I think having the having the second leg at home is always, always a bonus. Yeah, no, absolutely. And Bifiga is also... Coming off a, a, a fixture where they had to play the second leg in 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 France against Toulouse, um, and I think at this at this time because they took away the away goals, uh, I think that it, it, fixtures are very open in, in terms of the way teams approach their uh, away fixture. All right, because oftentimes the away fixture was something that well, let's not lose it here, and if we could bring it home, still. At a at a score line 
or an aggregate that we could still uh, recover at home while we have our fans behind us. Uh, it's something that teams right now, they're in a different position because of that away goal difference being taken away. Yeah, it's, you know, it, it changes the dynamic all, altogether. Um, it really does. Um, before we look at the teams here and now, um, I think it'd be it'd be remiss of us not to talk about the last time both teams played against each other. So um, we, we drew each other in the group stages. Um, it was three each in Portugal and two each in Glasgow. Um, from a Rangers point of view, it was so frustrating because I think you've seen the worst of Rangers, really silly mistakes, just allowing Benfica to play. Then when they got uh, a couple of the goals, some of the goals were very well worked with Rangers. So you've seen the best yeah. and the worst. What was your thoughts after those those two ties? Well, I, you know, I, like I said, I, I thought that it was uh, it was it was very wide open, uh, and from very the first leg, we saw that many goals being scored. We felt that both teams were going to play wide open, and even going uh, into the second leg and understanding how the teams approached the, the that match. I thought that uh, that it was something that both teams felt comfortable. They didn't feel that one team it was going to shut down and park the bus. Uh, so it, it, looking into at that fixture now, and it was, it was a bit ago, uh, it, it it felt that it was going to be a wide open because when it's wide open, there's so much that can happen rather than that predictable park the bus and it just uh, you know just incursion after incursion. At the at the defense, and then hoping that you could get that that break. Uh, but with the with the way both teams approached it, and, and with the fact that there was a very open game and a lot of goals, I think that that leaves teams uh, more with a better outlook in terms of how the fixture could turn out. So, so on Benfica just now, then um, obviously at the time of recording, uh, they've just came off the back of a two-one defeat. Um, yeah. uh, way to Sporting in the Cup um, and they're two points clear of Sporting um, in the league. Um, how How's Benfica's form so far obviously taken tonight into consideration? Well, you know, the story this year has been um, that Benfica has one of the best and deepest squad that we've had in, in many years. Uh Spent a lot of money bringing guys. We brought Di Maria. Uh, we brought a couple other guys. Uh, but the biggest, the biggest storyline I feel for Benfica has been the way Roger Schmidt has managed this team and has managed the talent and the depth in the squad. Uh, and there's a lot of Benficistas, myself included, that feel that with the squad and the depth that you have available, that Benfica should be doing a lot better than what they're doing. And when you look at the results and you look at the table, yes, Benfica is, is, got, is, is in first place with Sporting still with the, a game on hand. Um, you look at the fixtures and you look at, at the, the table and you say, well, we're doing well. But the fact of the matter is that every Benficaista, as we watch the game, it's frustrating. Uh, there's no um, consistent starting 11. There's a lot of tinkering every game. Uh, like, for example, uh, today and, and the, the fixture prior, domestically over the weekend, Benfica played without a striker. They were playing a lower table team, and we had a lot of success. We won 4 nothing. Uh, so Roger Schmidt said, well, this is working. I'm just going to go and have the same approach against Sporting. And the fact of the matter is that in the first half, Benfica had two shots on net, and Sporting owned most of the possession and most of the initiative of, of, uh, of the game. And that's a little bit of what the story has been. Roger Schmidt lining up as what he feels is going to be his best starting 11. And then at the halfway point, he makes the changes that everybody felt that these were supposed to be the changes that you make to start the game. Uh, and then Benfica ends up correcting itself in a way. But the fact of the matter is that with the, the, the talent that Benfica has and the depth, that Benfica has, this team should be playing a lot better. Uh, and at this point, regardless of us having beaten Porto in the first round, Sporting in the first round, Braga in the first round, so all our direct opponents, we beat them in the first round. 
there's been a lot of points that we've dropped with teams that are middle to lower uh, low table uh, that are really leave us scratching our heads in terms of what this team is or what we know the potential this team has and what Roger Schmidt has been able to do with this team. So it's it's been a, a rather frustrating season, uh, but I think that there's a couple, there's two factions of, of Benfica fans. There's a faction that looks at it, we're still in it, we're in Europe, we're in the Portuguese Cup, we're, domestically we're still alive. So we're in three fronts, we're competing in three fronts and, and nobody should be complaining. And then there's the other faction that feels that this team is underperforming for the quality that they have. And where do you fall on that? What what side of the camp do you fall on? I'm sorry, say that again. What what side of the fans do you fall on? Are you frustrated? Or <laughs> I, you... I I fall on the underperforming because uh, there's 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 been some choices that it, it leaves us scratching our head. We we uh, have been playing with adapted fullbacks. Uh, Auschwitz, who has been who is a midfielder, has been playing a right back for most of the season. At left back, we had somebody that we went and, and got, and it he didn't pan out. We ended up loaning them. Uh, then we went to get – we got a, a Spanish kid that was on loan at Granada from Man U uh, that is a left back. He's still young, has not adapted. So uh, Roger Schmidt is playing with a center back that's adapted to uh, to the left back. And, and it basically, you you take away – some of the verticality that left backs can can bring a normal left back can go up the wing to do the whole corridor uh and and really benfica has been kind of like a one-legged team if you will when you don't have that verticality and the ability to go forward with the fullbacks that, that's interesting that um yeah you're limited in the fullback area because what Rangers have a big focus on their fullbacks attacking and linking up with the the wide players. Um, so from a Rangers point of view, that may be an area that they yeah. they try and exploit. I'd say even on the counter attack. Um, uh, a player I wanted to ask you about and probably into how the game will be won or lost for both teams. I think Rangers. Um, I've put a real focus on the midfield over the last couple of months. So we've got John Lundstrom hitting form. We've got Dio Mandy has just signed and Tom Lawrence in front of him. And Todd Campbell's been injured. But it's really, John Lundstrom really has been the heartbeat of the team. But um, I, forgive me, I don't watch a lot of Portuguese football, but some of the podcasters have been ranting and raving about the 19-year-old Neves, yeah. the defensive midfielder. Um, from what I gather, I think it's going to be a really interesting battle in the midfield. Yeah, no, it will be. It will be an interesting battle, but it all depends on how Benfica lines up. So, uh, João Neves, who has been a staple of the lineup, uh, as you mentioned, 19-year-old, very smart, very aware. He always seems to be a couple moves ahead of everyone in that in that center midfield, and that's that's what you need, right? You you have to be able to anticipate where you're going to go with the ball next. Where's your outlet pass? So, I I think in in a way, Benfica's Midfield has been um, somewhat consistent. And then there's the partnership. There's Kokshud, uh, the Turkish international that we grabbed from PSV, uh, who is a player that we feel that he could be playing a lot a lot further up the field. He could be playing in almost in that 10 position, not the classical 10, but the, the, the 10 that goes between that midfield and the, 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 the forward line. Uh, and then there's there's Jo Mario who is also a player that can control the timings uh, of of the midfield uh, in the center of the park uh, but he's also a player that some say doesn't have that intensity that pressing intensity uh, that box to box uh, trait uh, and then we we have uh, Florentino who is another Benfica Academy product who is just your, your classic destroyer who covers a lot of ground and is very good defensively. As a matter of fact, I think that he, he held the, in the group stages, he held the record for uh, most, uh, most uh, turnovers caused by him or, or most recoveries, I should say. So it, it all depends on, on how Roger Schmidt decides to, to field uh, what kind of, what kind of duo he's or, or coupling that he's going to field in the midfield. Uh, but I think that what we've seen, Roger Schmidt is a man that he lines up 
uh, 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 starting eleven. If that works, he was he's going to repeat. He's going to repeat, despite having uh, players with different traits for for the different positions, whether it's a forward, whether it's a center mid. He's a he's a coach that repeats a lot. He doesn't look at his squad and he doesn't look at the opposition and said, "Hmm, this opposition, I see some weak spots here and there. Perhaps if if we went with some more muscle in the midfield or some more finesse in the midfield, it will do us better." So I think that the one of the biggest things that we have kind of pointed the finger at Roger Schmidt is is the is lack of uh, ability to read the opponents, to study the opponents, to scout the opponents, and feel the team that is going to get the most out of the opponents that he's playing against. That's interesting because we've had this conversation around uh, Philip Clement after last night where we feel, th- to be fair, that he's, he's not done it too many times, but we felt he didn't start the right line up um, against Kilmarnock but what Clement's been really good at has been making subs early in the game, so making subs at half time early in the second half and, and changing the game uh, How's yeah. that for Benfica? Um, do, well, do you have the same? <laughs> That, well, that's that's another that's another sticking point, and I, and I could go forever in terms of <laughs> Roger Schmidt and the things that the the little things that we can point out to Roger Schmidt. Roger Schmidt is not your your classic coach in terms of making adjustments. You will make adjustments right at the half when he feels that he got the starting eleven wrong, uh, but in terms of substitutions, he's not your guy that will bring in two players at his 60th minute, but rather. 75th minute, he's making his first substitution. I think he today against Sporting, he went into the 80th minute before he made this his second substitution. Um, so it's it, we've pointed a lot of things at Roger Schmidt in terms of the way when he touches the team. It's not it's not your typical 60th minute substitution. He goes very deep into the game before he makes the substitutions. We've even seen him do substitutions in the 90th minute. Uh, and, and and some of us think, well, how how do players interpret this? How do they feel about that they're warming up the whole game? And then they get two or three game, two or three minutes to go in in the field and try to make a difference. So it, you know that that's another thing. And in his PSV days were the same way. There was a lot of complaints in terms of him making changes to the team. Uh, there's there's an ongoing joke that he just stands on the sidelines with the hands in his pocket and he's he's sleeping basically with his eyes open. Uh, so there's been a lot of criticism hurled at at uh, Roger Schmidt. Uh, because you know he hasn't, he doesn't, he doesn't touch the team when we feel it, touches need to be made. Uh, and again, look, he's the professional; he's the one that's being paid to do the job. So it's like, well, we could hurl all this criticism, but at the end of the day, he's the one that's getting paid to make the decisions. Yeah, and it's a hard, it's a hard balance where you know you want. On one hand, we all think how the manager should yeah. pick the team and how they should play. But if a manager starts bowing down to the fans, then you're going to say, "No, you're weak. You need to, you need to stand by your judgment." But right. probably just to, to, to summarise, then is so Benfica strong squad, a lot of big big players. I mean, we've got Otamendi, we've got Di Maria, yeah. we've got Silva, um, Joao Neves, as you said, um, a lot of talented players. Probably just not as consistent um, as you'd yeah. like to be. Is that a fair assessment then? Yeah, no, and, and it is. Uh, and I think that a lot of a lot of fans grew enamored with Roger Schmidt because when he came last season, uh, we had players that allowed us to to press very high. And with that high press, that w- we were turning the ball uh, or, or the opposition were turning the ball and we were going right at it. Uh, with the loss of Gonzalo Hamsh, who ended up going to PSV, and he was the, the first line of pressure. Uh, and then with, with Di Maria not really being that player that chases defenders, that that tracks back. Uh, so it's it's been difficult in, in finding that magic formula that we had last year, this year, because the squad is just different. They have different traits. They have players with different abilities that uh, they may not bring the high press, but you know, Di Maria, Di Maria with the play, he could change the game. But again, now we have to adapt, right? We have to find a way to balance the defensive transition because we can't 
Di Maria doesn't track back. So how do we balance uh, a, a team that that comes at us without having a, a player in the midfield that doesn't track back, that doesn't follow the the opponent f- fullback? So it's it's been a, a big mixture in terms of finding that right formula for Benfica. And I think there's there's very far and few games this season where we've watched the game and we've said. This is it. This is this is the team. This is the team that's playing up to their potential. So it's been it's been somewhat a frustrating season. Uh, and even though you may look at the table and said, but what what are you so frustrated about? But if he goes in first, right? They're in in, in three competitive fronts. Uh, but the thing is that the biggest frustration stems from us feeling that this team could do so much more, and then the stubbornness of Roger Schmidt to sticking to his guns. Yeah, it's interesting because um, what just what you described there, that, that was my point of view of Benfica in yeah. the last 16 of the Europa League, top of the league. Yeah. What's to worry about? But <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah. I mean, you you look at the Toulouse fixture, right? And Toulouse is a team that was eliminated by a third division team of the, uh, of the, the French Cup. They're a team that's currently fighting um to stay to, to stay up and Benfica with the squad that we have uh you know we barely win in Lisbon we go to France and we're saved by the woodwork and by a great performance by our Ukrainian goalkeeper Trubin and we come out of there and and Roger Schmidt says we we played better over the two legs and and it's just something that as, as Benficistas we're not happy with that. We're, we can't settle for mediocrity. Uh, Benfica should have been wiping the floor with Toulouse uh, because as we look at Toulouse today or, or what they've been doing this season, is a team that's well, well below of w- what Benfica's caliber is currently. Yeah, and that's in, in relative terms. I think I understand that when um, in Scotland, Rangers come up against, you know, no disrespect here, but your mother will, your your hearts, yeah. your commander can Rangers should be winning comfortably because we're the bigger club, you know. And so I can understand a club the size of Benfica's stature, you know, rich European heritage, they're in one of the top six leagues, um, constant European football. I can understand that that frustration. Winning isn't always just winning isn't enough. Sometimes you need to win well, you need to see the progression. Yeah, especially when you've gone out and you you basically have spent a record amount of money in bringing all these all these all these players, right? And, and granted that after Benfica sold Juan Felix, after Benfica sold uh, Ruben Diaz, after Benfica sold Gonçalo Ramos, I think that teams now look at Benfica and saying, well. You know, now you deal with the big boys. Now you negotiate with with the big boys because if you want this player, you're going to have to pay. Just like you know, when there's an English team that comes in and, and gets one of our players, they, Benfica asks for a lot of money. Uh, we sold Enzo for over Enzo to Chelsea for over a hundred, a hundred million. So I think that when we enter negotiations now, we uh, the some of the leverage that we we would have as a smaller club. Now it kind of goes away. It goes away because uh, clubs know that Benfica has made these big deals. And as a result, if you want our players, you're going to have to pay. And we know you got the money. So looking ahead to the first leg again, um, when Rangers travel to Lisbon, um, what's your... I like to round off every podcast with a prediction for the next game. So what's your honest prediction for what the score will be? Um, yeah, you know, with the season Benfica has, has been having, uh, you never know what team is going to show up. Uh, this fixture comes off of the sporting game that just happened today for the Portuguese Cup, and it's a two legged affair, so things are still open. And now we bring it to uh, to our stadium to play the second leg. But we have we have also have our, our arch rival. Uh, Porto to play over the weekend and, and albeit Porto is nine points behind Benfica and uh, nothing depending on on the result of the game nothing is going to change in terms of you know Porto is not going to leapfrog Benfica or not but the fact of the matter is that every time we go to Porto it seems that we have 
somewhat of a stigma. Uh, it seems that the players are are, are fearful. They're hesitant. Uh, they uh, become intimidated. Uh, and the biggest thing is that with Sporting having the consistency that they've had this season, uh, if Benfica loses por- points against Porto this weekend, now we're in a in a much worse position. And now the fact that we just played Sporting and Sporting knows that they can beat Benfica despite Benfica's squad. So I, I don't know. I, I mean, in terms of the fixture, coming on the heels of these two very important domestic fi- fixtures, it's going to, to be tough. Uh, but I think that it, it's going to depend a lot on what Benfica shows up for this game because we've been our worst enemies in basically almost every single European fixture this year. Uh, we played Salzburg the first round of the, of the of the group stages of the Champions League. We underestimated them, ended up losing that game in, in, in Lisbon. Uh, we played a, a, a very good um, Spanish team that that I that I'm now uh, their name skips me. Um, but it, it, you know, it's it's been hard. It's been hard in terms of um, the consistency and performance. And right now, if Benfica has has had a good run of games where they're playing well, where they're scoring goals, where they're beating teams, and the team seems to be at a, at a good momentum, I would feel a lot more confident in terms of this fixture. I think that Rangers is going to be it's going to be difficult for Benfica. Uh, teams from 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 the the British Isles are usually very physical very direct, uh, very no-nonsense. Uh, and I think that Benfica may struggle with a team like that. Interesting, because I think when you're saying, um, you know, disciplined, no-nonsense, um, Rangers have had much more discipline under Philippe Clement, but they still switch off at the wrong times. We've seen yeah. it against Real Betis, and we've seen it against even domestically Hearts and Celtic. And and I think Rangers need to be disciplined and concentrated and focused. And I, I think a, a lot of it is going to have to come on the counter, but they need to be solid at the back. Um, so I, I do think, um, you know, it sounds like it may be a good time to get Benfica if it is ever a good yeah. time, but Rangers still really need to, they need to be on their game for this, this tie. No, and, and I agree. I agree that how inconsistent Benfica has been kind of leave this fixture uh, up. It's really open. Uh, and despite the draw and figuring, well, Rangers is is the, is the least, the hardest, least hardest opponent that we could have gotten. When you look at Leverkusen, you can look at Liverpool, so on and so forth. Those, those are all teams that we could have gotten. Uh, right, even Atalanta from Italy. Right, that Sporting yeah. drew uh-huh. Atalanta. Um, we feel that yes, it's it's accessible. Uh, it's an accessible game, but we have to show up. We can't just let the shirts and the names play the game. We have to show up. And often in Europe, players get up to play in Europe. Uh, you know, so it, it's different motivation, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and I think that Benfica has to be at a very good level. To, to an, an honest and consistent level and not underestimate Rangers, which have had their struggles throughout the season, uh, right? But I think that at, at this time, we have to go in there and, and and feel the need to compete and feel the need to um, grab a result. So when we're going, so not to leave the fixture to, to Glasgow, which I think it would probably not be a very good idea, understanding the atmosphere at the Ibrox. So it's good to get your, your take on it, um, Alfredo. It's been it's been good to speak to you. Thank you very much for coming on. Uh, before I let you go, tell the listeners where they can find more of you. Yeah, so um, BenficaPodcast.com is our site. We are... Uh, We're the longest running Benfica podcast, albeit in English and in Portuguese, right? Uh, We started our podcast about 12 years ago, uh, and we've been going strong since then. So just when podcasts were were starting to be a thing, that's when we got on board. Uh, So we have a a weekly podcast in English for any any fans that want to follow Benfica. 
uh, BenficaPodcast.com on X uh, at Benfica Podcast, so on and so forth. And uh, I really appreciate the you know the invitation and the opportunity to come in and and talk a little bit ahead of this fixture. No, it's been great having you on. Um, it's it's been brilliant. Listen, uh, all the best for the rest of the season. Apart from this one fixture, <laughs> I hope it doesn't go well. But the rest of the season. I'm, I'm no, of, of, of course, <laughs> of, of course, and uh, I, you know, I think that uh, Rangers is a very well respected team. Uh, and to be honest with you, I'd rather cheer for Rangers than to cheer for Celtic, uh, because of the colors, right? Because of the, of the... <laughs> I'll take it, I'll take it, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, um, so so yes, yeah, so, like I said, it, it, best of luck, and and really at the end of the day, is it, it's the team that that wants it the most, and it's going to be most consistent over the two legs is the team that that's going to go into the next round amazing thanks for coming on and as always thank you to all the listeners and um, let us know what you think in the comments and um, what your predictions are ahead of the game and we will speak to you again next time take care <laughs>